Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Strategy Performance Scrutiny Board, Wednesday the 3rd of June. Uh, this is our first live meeting of the Scrutiny Board, um, so it could be quite interesting. Obviously, we're dealing with technology, and when you're dealing with technology and live at the same time, you can guarantee that something will most probably go wrong. So <laughs> it's just to make people aware who's actually watching this because I believe there is quite a number of members of the public watching this meeting this evening that if there is some hiccups it's because everything is live and a lot of this is is new to us all a new way of actually working but a good way of actually working as well because at least we can actually continue with what's important and that's council business and business that impacts on uh, our communities. Uh, this evening, we've got uh, four items on the agenda. Um, revenue outturn, devolution progress and timescales, work plan and annual report. Uh, I have actually changed the agenda around this evening. Uh, so instead of having the revenue outturn first, we will have the annual report first. And then we'll do the uh, devolution progress and timescales. Then on to the revenue outturn. The revenue outturn also comes with a separate report which went to Cabinet on the 27th of April, which is a financial update. So what we'll do is we'll go through the revenue outturn, ask any questions on that, and then we'll have a look at that report if anybody's got any questions on that to ask, to ask Nigel. And then obviously at the end of that, we'll go on to our work plan, so nobody needs to stay. Um, Okay, going on to substitutes, nominated for this meeting and apologies for absence. Is that there are no, there are no, there are no apologies and no absences, um, Councillor Bellinger. Right, thank you very much, sorry. Members interest, uh, members of the board will be asked if, they, no, members of the board, do any members have any uh, disclosable pecuniary or any other interest which would prevent them from participating in any discussion on the items or participate in any vote upon the items within this meeting. No. Okay. Admission to the public. Um, there is no ex exempt items this evening on this. And I do believe there are quite a number of members of the public watching in this evening as well. So as quite rightly said at the beginning of the meeting, obviously please watch our P's and Q's. Uh, minutes of the Strategy Performance Scrutiny Board meeting held on the 6th of February. Now, this actually feels quite a long time ago. Um, I've gone through these minutes again today. I can't see anything uh, that's amiss with these meetings, uh, with these minutes, sorry. Uh, if anybody else has found anything. No, I think I'll, I'll second the chair. But just to make a comment, I'm surprised that on the 19th, or the 6th of February, at least really, we, we had no idea about COVID-19. Oh. It's just amazing how far we've come uh, since that meeting um, uh, and, and, and what's happened. So uh, I just think that the right has been a long, long time. Okay. So... And I'll also comment, Chair, that it's it was before the floods as well. If you look at some of the comments on there about... Um, you know, looking after the roads and so on, it was it was pre the flooding, pre COVID, pre everything. It looks like it's from a very naive time time that those minutes it does it does doesn't say i was thinking that today when i was reading through yep. reading through that so um so, so naeem you're happy to propose them as correct and anyone to second that proposal happy to second okay council rob Olden to second that okay so moving on to the uh, annual report um so i think Lauren, is this you and Mike that's going to be talking on this? Yes, please, Chair. Um, I mean, we won't run through the report. I think it's online and it's fairly brief, so hopefully members will have an opportunity to have, have a read of it. Um, it's sort of the first of its kind. I think one's gone to place already. We've done them for each of the scrutiny boards individually. And hopefully moving forward, they're going to be part of a more full or comprehensive annual report that will be submitted to council, um, sort of looking at all the boards across the piece. Um, it reflects on sort of the items that S&P have looked at throughout the year, um, some of the detailed review work as well. 
and also some of those items that members have recommended that we bring forward to this year and that we might want to look at a little bit more in detail. Um, obviously, I'll cover some of those under the work programme, if you like, but some of the key issues that sort of came out of our informal meeting in the last meetings were around um, corporate performance and communications and also some things around legal services and HR sort of recruitment. So, yeah, happy to take any questions if there are any. OK. I, I, I like the report, I must admit. It's something that which we mentioned that we should have had quite a while ago. And like I say, it gives people, especially members of the public, an idea of what we actually do as scrutiny boards. Um, but it also allows us to refer back as well to stuff that we've that we've done. So I, I like it. That. So any questions, members, on that? Uh, Councillor Lynn? Uh, yes, I, I think it'll come up under our work programme. But I just, I was really pleased to see the work that um, Councillor Naeem and I led on, um, along with yourself, in relation to diversity in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope very much that we're, when we come to talk about our work programme, we'll be able to consider including an opportunity to review the seven, recommenda <clears throat> seven recommendations that we made at the end of that review um, and see where we've, where our HR people and everybody else have actually got to on it. That was all. Thank mm -hmm. you. No, thank you. Mike? Uh, th thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add that <clears throat> the, to the point that Lauren made um, about taking um, all four reports, if you like, from each of the boards as one annual report to Council. And I think it's quite an important thing that Council gets an opportunity from time to time just to reflect on on how you as a group of 51 councillors to fulfil your scrutiny function. Um, we, we haven't actually taken, we've done it before, but we haven't done it for three or four years. So I think it's it's really important. And I just want to also say uh, thank you to, to Lauren in this instance and Alex Hunter for the other boards on the work they've done in pull, pulling these reports together. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, thank you. Who would you suggest actually brings this to full council? <coughs> Uh, what we well what we what we did in the past was um, uh, we asked for volunteers amongst from one of the chairs of the scrutiny board, um, and, uh, and, the, and the and 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 the last one to step backwards um, got the job. So so the chair one of the chairs will, will present the report. I'm sure. Right. Fair enough. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. Right. Is there any more questions on on that, members? No, okay, okay. If not, we shall move on to our devolution progress and timescales, which I believe, Ian, if you're with us, I can't see Ian. This it just takes a second, councillor, for them to come through. Right, okay. Let me... Uh, I think they've joined us now, Councillor Bellinger. Are they? Right, okay, okay. Let me just have a look. I'm just trying to find the first page of, of this, scrolling down to the financial report, item six. Okay, the purpose of this report, um, just so people are aware, the West Yorkshire Minotaur devolution deal was announced as part of the budget on the 11th of March 2020, subject to consultation and statutory process. This will be led ultimately to the adoption of a mayoral combined authority model with additional functions and will require an order of the Secretary of State. Um, I've just got something that's come up on my screen. I'll clear that off. Okay, okay. So, Ian, are you with us? Yep. I don't know if you can hear us, Ian, have you? Yes, sorry, I am, Councillor, oh. thank you. Right, okay, okay. So yeah, this is over, I've, I've changed, I don't know if you were in at the beginning, Ian, but I've changed the order around on the agenda for this evening and uh, brought this in first uh, before our revenue outturn report. Uh, so if you're happy to, to lead on this now. Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, 
the report that uh, went to cabinet on the 21st was, um, I hope, comprehensive in setting out the process that is currently underway for uh, approval of the consultation process on the, the draft scheme that's been prepared. That draft scheme uh, sets out um, the powers that are uh, proposed are granted to the uh, mayoral combined authority. And it's a consultation that uh, requests a comment uh, and observation on the extent of those powers and on the uh, proposal that um, we appoint uh, uh, an elected mayor uh, next May in order for that mayor to um, have uh, some devolved powers for dealing with uh, regional issues through the, the combined authority. Um, the scheme that is contained uh, within the documents as an appendix is, uh, again, very comprehensive and goes through in some detail both the mayoral powers and the powers that are retained by the combined authority uh, and separates those out into uh, those functions that are exercised by the mayor without there being any uh, power of, of veto exercised by the combined authority, but there are situations where uh, there will need to be cooperation between the mayor and the, the members of the combined authority, which are the uh, proposed to be the leaders of the five West Yorkshire authorities, uh, three um, other members from uh, across West Yorkshire to uh, arrive at a political balance, and uh, a non-voting uh, member from uh, York City Council and from, uh, from the LEP. Um, the timetable, I heard Councillor Bellinger, you mentioned that the timetable that is um, now in operation for uh, this to progress is that the consultation that's currently underway, that will last until the 19th of July. Uh, there's then a period obviously of collating the uh, responses and observations and comments that are um, submitted as part of that consultation. It's proposed then that there is a cabinet meeting towards the end of August uh, within Calderdale and similarly across the other um, four West Yorkshire authorities in order for there to be a presentation uh, of the responses that are submitted. Um, it isn't technically required but what is um, proposed is that the recommendation that cabinet uh, arrives at uh, probably at a meeting uh, on the 24th of August, although that's yet to be finalised. Uh, we'll then go through to a full council meeting uh, held virtually um, during the week beginning the 31st of August, that's the bank holiday uh, week, when um, the timetable that is imposed upon us by uh, MHCLG requires there to be a decision arrived at uh, by the end of that first week, effectively that first week in September, so the 4th of September, in order for the parliamentary timetable to then allow for the scheme to be uh, converted into a parliamentary order, uh, in order for the timetable to be then further uh, implemented for the uh, election that will need to take place uh, in May of next year for the appointment of, uh, of the mayor. So that's the, the broad timetable. There will also be a, um, um, a consent to the order that's, that's drafted and that's likely now to be slipping through to, to November rather than uh, initially proposed to be the end of September. But again, that's just part of the, the, the sort of legislative process that we have to undertake. The consultation, there were some questions raised at Cabinet about the consultation and obviously bearing in mind that there are limitations placed upon all councils at the moment as opposed to uh, the way in which we would normally undertake consultations through drop-in sessions. Uh, there's a significant, pre significant presence that's uh, taking place uh, online. That will be complemented by some, um, some mail shots and some radio and television advertising to try and ensure that as many people as possible are, are made aware of the, the process that's underway uh, and as many views and comments uh, as, as possible can be sought. I had a, a catch up um, with my West Yorkshire colleagues across Heads of Legal uh, earlier today. It's a weekly catch up that we're having through the, the devolution process. 
And my counterpart at uh, the Combined Authority indicated that already there have been over uh, 600 uh, responses to the consultation, which um, in the scheme of things is significantly high um, for the type of consultation that this is. So that's encouraging. Um, brings with it obviously some demands on an assessment of those those responses and it's something that we're looking to do as the process continues rather than leaving them all to be considered at the end of the, um, the consultation period. Um, Councillor, I don't know whether there's any issues that uh, you want me to go through at this stage as far as the actual devolution deal is concerned. I'm hoping that it is uh, well explained and well set out in the uh, in the reports that uh, have been circulated to all members as part of the cabinet process. Yeah. Uh, but if any members have any specific questions either on the uh, the governance or the um, the deal itself, then um, there is some questions coming through. In it is quite an extensive report. I must admit, I've I've read through it today, and it's quite an impressive report. It really, really is. Is this report something that's out there in the public domain as well? It was published as part of the, the cabinet papers, so it's it's a report that has been published um, in very similar terms across all the five West Yorkshire authorities. So yeah. uh, it's been available on the, the council's website um, from about the, the 18th, or, well, actually earlier than that, probably the 13th or so of, uh, of, of, of um, it would have been on 13th of May. Right. Ish. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got some questions coming through. I think Councillor Lynn. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, well, first, first of all, um, I'm really pleased to see that in the three or four years since the, um, the issue of the mayor was first mooted, we've actually managed to secure an increase from 30 million to 38 million. So let's say in terms of the funding. So, you know, and, and that's probably ahead of inflation. So well done to everybody who's been involved in negotiating that. The second point is that I think that I've been particularly impressed during this emergency with the, um, the profile that Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, has been able to achieve in terms of really making some good points um, about how the situation is affecting his area and how the government action or inaction is affecting his area. So I can see looking forward that if we do have a mayor um, for West Yorkshire, I can actually sort of see the point. Um, but my my kind of comment, really, I, I actually I I enjoyed reading the, um, the the governance review, particularly the the economy bits, because that's that's one of the things I'm really interested in. Um, and of course, the some of the things that that come through there very strongly are that we've got quite a distinctive economy in uh, in Calderdale, which is quite which in some ways is significantly different from that of Leeds and of Wakefield and the other districts. And one of the things, one of the ways in which we, I think we are different, we've got higher levels of manufacturing and so on. But I'm also very conscious of the fact that we're the, and you wouldn't be surprised, uh, people won't be surprised about this, that as the most west, uh, the most um, westerly of the, uh, the districts, we're the ones that have got the greatest flow. It's about, around about 10% of our people, our work, workers actually travel across into Greater Manchester. I've got two neighbours, one of whom's just finished furloughing, she's a welder, she's gone off to work in Rochdale, and um, another neighbour, um, Shazma's husband, has just gone across to work in, um, I think, a food factory in, in Rochdale. So my two nearest neighbours both work in Rochdale and they travel from Halifax. So my question really is, um, there's nothing that I see there, or, apart from one fairly perfunctory mention of the Northern Powerhouse. There's nothing that really, I think, picks up um, the fact that we do have significant links um, going across into Greater Manchester. And those will only increase if we succeed in getting um, better rail links, which we're all trying pushing for. So I, I suppose, I, I mean, I guess what I'm saying, I can say in the consultation, in response to the consultation, but I just would be interested if anybody who's been involved in negotiating this would like to come back um, to say whether um, there's been any discussion about that. And I noticed, uh, Ian, you talked about, you know, linking, liaising with, um, you know, with your opposite numbers in the other districts. But I mean, I would actually also, because one of my, my big bugbears really about us in Goldendale is we do need to look west as well as east. So I'd be really interested in the extent to which um, everybody that's involved in this process is actually learning from the experiences of Greater Manchester, who after all have got a few more years ahead of us on this. Thanks. 
Anyway, Ian, do you want, you want to come back at that? Well, can say it's probably more appropriate that um, I know I've just seen on, on the chat function that um, Councillor Scullion's indicated that um, she would wish to comment on that and um, probably more appropriate that uh, that she does so or, or in okay. fact, uh, the leader. Yeah, that's fine. Councillor Scullion, if you want to come in on, on that one. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Lynn's absolutely right that actually our border with Greater Manchester is very significant for us. Um, and it has been, in some ways, very internally focused in terms of strengthening West Yorkshire, uh, working together, and also making sure that we keep our historical links with the city of York. Mm. But nonetheless, we have in Calderdale been particularly fighting our corner in relation to the importance of this. And we've been fighting it, I guess, in, in two ways. The first is around the transport issues. That transport connectivity with the Greater Manchester conurbation is really crucial to us in terms of rail, um, future mass transit systems, etc. And that, that looking outwards, there's a great desire, I think, to look always towards London or indeed to Birmingham. We have been strongly pushing as Calderdale that transport connectivity um, over to, to the West. I think the other thing to say is that um, it's important really to recognize this, this devolution deal, this government minded to offer us a devolution deal in relation to who's at the table and who has the ear of the civil servants and the relevant ministers. You will have noticed yourself that the conversations have changed in terms of local government with elected mayors such as Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester, but not just him, the, the mayor in Birmingham and so on, being invited to give views to central government in a way that they have not necessarily been inviting uh, leaders of councils. So is it really, really important? And we have actually been, and the officers at uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority have actually been obviously looking at what happens in, in Greater Manchester very, very closely in relation to that. But it is different. Each one of these devolution deals is very different. Uh, I don't know, Chair, if the leader's um, got something to say because he has been right right there in the coal face in the negotiations yeah councillor swift if you want if you want to come in at this point it's fine i know we've got a few more members wanting to ask questions uh, but if you want to come in at this point um yeah I'll, I'll i'll probably pick up pick up a bit more on further questions if that's okay chair but but just to reinforce what um what jane said on uh, on the importance of those cross, cross cutting links um yeah I mean, a lot of the rail and transport discussions through transport for the North feel a little bit distant and, again, perhaps more dominated by the existing mayor. So I think having a West Yorkshire mayor on there batting our corner is, is, is really important because those connections are there. And, of course, yeah. one of the arguments we consistently need to make is that for us it's not just about um, sort of HS3 or Transpennine Rail or whatever you call it, which is about connecting the cities it's those commuter links that the Calder Valley line, that effectively the Calder Valley line is like the, um, you know, it's like London Central line, isn't it? It, 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 it isn't just about getting from Hebden Bridge to, to Leeds or Hebden Bridge to Manchester. It's about all those connections along the way. And I think getting it understood that of, of that, um, those commuter connections is, is a really important part of, part of that. Um, and yeah, I mean, whether you like the mayoral systems or not, it is clear, you know, the Met, having a mayor gives you a national voice in a way that council leaders find find difficult to achieve consistently mm. and we need to be in the room for those conversations mm. i mean I, I do have my reservations regarding having a metro mayor but again it depends on the person that actually gets that position at the end of the day who gets voted in to do that at the end of the day i think we've done really well so far over the years you know punching above our weight as, as a Calderdale authority with the west yorkshire combined authority and if we could actually continue that, that'd be absolutely fantastic. You know, take my hat off to you, Tim. This is something that you've done for us for, for quite some time and, you know, and well done. Um, Councillor Gallagher, I think you want to come in with a question? Do I? Yeah, I've got you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. You've got me down as what? So I haven't got, sent your message. I've got you down. I just wanted to ask a question. Oh, have you? Yeah. Are you sure Councilor, it's me? Councillor Gallagher and Councillor Porritt. 
Sorry, love, I haven't got All right, no problem. I don't know where I've been fiddling with an ear. <laughs> don't worry. C counsel for it, I'll come across to you then. Thanks. I actually hadn't put in that I wanted to ask the question either because I hadn't got around to it, but I kind of have got a question, so I'll take my opportunity. Okay. Um, it, it's just, uh, I know we've mentioned before, I know Councillor Lynn has mentioned before, some concerns that we had with regard to scrutiny at um, West Yorkshire Combined Authority level. And there was just a few little statements that, that came out in this um, report that don't give me the greatest of confidence with regard to, to the improvements of scrutiny there. Um, it says the Mayor and Combined Authority will be scrutinised and held to account by the Combined Authority's overview and scrutiny and governance and audit committees. The arrangements currently established by the Combined Authority will, will be retained. Well, if we're not happy with those, then are we happy with that? Subject to any amendments required, and it's all quite woolly. And then it says the Mayor and the Combined Authority may also seek to enhance scrutiny. And I just really wanted to, um, to put in that we do want to ensure that particularly somebody with such visibility and such obvious personal powers is subject to the required scrutiny at whatever level that needs to happen. But if we're already not sure about the effectiveness of WICA uh, scrutiny, then that needs to be beefed up before we even consider um, what might happen at a mayoral level. Mm. I think that's that's a good point, is that council for it? And it's something that myself and Councillor Robinson recently had a, a meeting with uh, Cali from the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. And I think that was one of their concerns as well, wasn't it, George, regarding the improvement of scrutiny and more scrutiny uh, committees really to look at various things throughout the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. But I don't know if anybody wants to come back on, on that one for, for Councillor for it. I can, Councillor, if you'd like. Um, I think it's a very uh, well-made point and one that has been uh, discussed uh, several times uh, with uh, my counterparts at my um, regular Wednesday morning meeting. Um, there's a great deal of work to do um, between now and next May. Uh, there are many, many work streams that uh, need to start picking up and, and, and continue with uh, the detail that will be required for the implementation of the mayoral combined authority. Uh, scrutiny is one of those areas that needs to um, be enhanced and that's been an accepted and recognized issue certainly amongst the heads of legal across West Yorkshire mm -hmm. so I think I'm, I'm confident in saying that there will be uh, a, a, a better system in place for for scrutiny for the for the mayoral combined authority come next May um, there's work to be done to ensure that is the case and the uh, the scheme itself will, will probably be, um, be be reflective of that so uh, yes, thanks, Councillor Porridge. It's it's a it's a well made point. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Dickinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, the question I have concerns the level to which we all have um, autonomous self autonomous powers. Um, pretty much top of the list in the report there is the uh, the climate emergency and. There are a number of different ways in which we might be able to approach that as the work on the uh, the climate committee will uh, be able to produce with, with, with their action plan in due course. Um, but my, my preoccupations tend to centre on um, planning and its uh, excellence in that potential for excellence in that regard. Um, so just as using that as an example, would do, do we potentially have a situation where, for example, we'd be able to set our own planning regulations as, a, as an autonomous area, or do we, would that, that still have to defer to, to national guidelines? Mm. Interesting point. Yeah, no, it would still have to comply with, with national policy guidance on, on, on planning. Um, inevitably, there are always local issues that would still um, be capable of being implemented and, and, and enforced, but the broad planning principles would, uh, would still come from, from national policy. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions, members, on that one? Councillor Gallagher, is that a hand up? <laughs> no. No, I can't hear. Right. If there's no more, if there's no more questions or nobody else wants, Councillor Gallagher, you want to come in? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what you, what, what, what are you seeing that I'm not? Your, your hand, your hand going so. <laughs> is it? <laughs> 
like that in the side. So I didn't know if it was a hand wave to say, can I come in or... <laughs> Well, it's, sorry, love. it's all right. I'll take it as a no. That's fine. Don't worry. Anybody else? Any questions or Councillor Scullion or Councillor Swift? Anything you want to come back on on that before we move on to the next item? Uh, if I could just briefly, Chair. I mean, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah um, obviously, the report the, the report about the governance is quite detailed and quite technical. I understand that, and obviously. Um, it's important that we get that right because um, you know there are some important safeguards in there. So mm. if you look through the things, you'll see there are a number of areas where the mayor has primacy, but actually there are various checks and balances in terms of the various leaders, um, you know, being able to, in some cases, block things. In some cases, you need a, a clear majority. In other cases, able to amend things. And similarly, there are powers that remain with the combined authorities. We've also resisted very hard any, uh, really any suggestion from government that there should be too much transfer of powers up from uh, individual councils there. And the only areas really where that happens are where effectively we already pull some of our highways powers, for example. The, the one key exception to that is the, um, the, the mayoral strategic, strategic planning framework. But again, for that to be approved, and that would only start to be developed in five years time because government recognized that we're all well advanced with current local plans again that would only be allowed to be implemented with the support of all five of the individual authorities so mm. it's just important to emphasize this is very much about trying to gain a bit more control over spending that's coming down from government rather than giving up powers locally it is a huge opportunity both in terms of the voice and in terms of the scale of investment in the original deal as I think I've said to members before, you know, the real lesson from particularly Greater Manchester is that once, you, once you've got the recognition as a, as a mayoral combined authority, you're much better placed to bid for additional funding in the future. And I think particularly the interest in the governance of <clears throat> government, for example, in kind of recognising that Leeds is the biggest city that doesn't have a mass transit scheme is important. The battle for us, as I've said before, and it links to what Councillor Lynn was saying, is getting recognition that West Yorkshire is not just a place that works with Leeds as a hub and the rest of us as spokes and that actually for, for ourselves and for Bradford and Kirk Lees, the connections between each, each other of us are as important as the connections in and out of Leeds. Mm -hmm. But that's an argument for us to continue to make and to make sure as the debate moves forward that we end up with a mayor and a combined authority who really understands what's needed for the whole of West Yorkshire yeah. so that we can make this a real benefit for all of us. Mm, I agree. Thank you, Councillor Swift. Um, I'm quite excited to see this happen and I think it's probably quite timely as well, especially with what we're going through at the moment, um, which at the end of the day could see us financially improved over the next few years. I do, I think it works out something point like 7.5 million a year that would get extra from this but obviously like you say councillor swift there's other things as well other pots of money that we could potentially get as well from that so which is good um okay everybody seeing as though there's nothing else on that nobody else has any questions we shall move on so thank you ian for coming in on that one for us councillor scully and councillor swift please feel free to stay if you want to stay we've got the um revenue outturn report next and obviously uh, to discuss the uh, report that went to Cabinet on the 27th of April as well regarding the uh, our financial situation at the moment with regards to the uh, pandemic. So thank you, Ian. Uh, please feel free to stay if you want to. Um, I think this is now time for Nigel. I think he's joining us somewhere. Um, the outturn report, the members will consider the revenue outturn for 2019-2020 report and have the opportunity to raise any questions related to the financial implications of COVID-19. So what I said we'll do is we'll go through this item now, um, through the outturn report. Any questions on this, we'll ask at the end of this report and then we'll have a look at the report, like I say, that went to Cabinet. I don't know if you've all had the opportunity to have a look at that. Uh, there's a few things in there that's that's raised some questions uh, with regards to some of the, the spend and I think some clarity is probably needed on um, some of these spends. Um, I've, I've spotted a few and I think Councillor Holden's also spotted a few that I think he wants to come in on as well. So Nigel, I'll, I'll 
I'll hand this over to you now for the uh, the outturn report. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the outturn report for the last financial year, uh, the headline figures are that there was an overspend of £4.2 million, which is actually an improvement of around £600,000 compared with the third quarter monitor that went to Cabinet. Mm. There were improvements in both children's and adult social care um, from the third quarter monitor and slightly worse positions in terms of public services and regeneration and strategy. The overspend is funded primarily by centrally controlled underspends of £2.8 million and £1.4 million from central reserves. Uh, the reserves overall have reduced by £800,000, but that uh, I need to express some caution about those figures because that includes £5.8 million worth of COVID-related grant, which actually needs to be spent in the current financial year. So in reality, in terms of reserves that are available, the reserves went down by £6.6 .6 million at the end of last financial year, down to a level of about £41 million in total. The Council's general balances, which are available to support unforeseen costs, stand at £5.5 .5 million, which is half a million pounds above the minimum recommended value. Mm -hmm. um, rather than go through any more of the report, I'll just um, uh, gladly take any comments or questions on the report, if that's okay, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I've had a read through the report. There's nothing really that, that sort of like stands out there to me. Um, I, I haven't mentioned much, but I'll open this up to, uh, to members straight away. If any members have got any questions on this, on this report they want to put forward. I'm not seeing any anything coming through on the on the chat. I guess everybody's happy with that report. Can I, can I get a can I get a nod? Is everybody happy with that report? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> as quick as as quick as that. That's gotta be the quickest report we've had on the uh, financial outturn I suppose. So uh, Okay, I appreciate what you're doing, Nigel, and I should imagine at this moment in time you are having probably very many sleepless nights, uh, which is very understandable. Um, and I'm glad I'm certainly not in your shoes at the moment. Um, what I'd like to bring up now is, is this report that went to Cabinet on the 27th of April, which was a financial update. Now, obviously, reading through this today, we're a month, just over a month on from this now, five weeks on, and it's it's probably quite out of date already with the way that things are actually moving financially within the authority. Um, so I don't know if you want to sort of like, just sort of like touch on this first, and then I'll open it up to, to members for any, any questions. Um, yes, if I may, I won't go through the detail of the report on the 27th of April, but they're no, absolutely no, 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 right. No. Yeah, yeah, just brief. You're absolutely right in terms of the position is changing on a daily, on an almost hourly basis. Um, so the report that went in April said that we had um, a, a financial gap of around £30 million forecast for the year. That was very much an initial estimate because at that stage uh, we didn't have much uh, information to actually go on. Um, since that day, we've received um, another £5.8 million or received an allocation of £5.8 million from government additional funding, taking total additional funding up to £11.8 million. But we've still got a projected gap shortfall at the moment between our additional costs and loss of income and additional government support of around £16 million. As I say, this position is changing on a daily basis. We're refining the figures as we go. We are now required to report on a monthly basis uh, to government department, that's all local authorities, updating on a monthly basis our financial projections for the year. And as I say, at the moment, we're currently projecting a shortfall between our costs and loss of income and against the government support of around £16 million. Some big unknowns in there, in particular on the income side, because actually two thirds of the um, additional cost actually relates to loss of income. 
And at this stage, you know, we forecast things like loss of council tax income and loss of business rates income, we, which we won't actually know um, in actuality until we get further into the financial year. We know exactly what we're losing in terms of income on facilities such as sports centres, which have closed. But mm. Council tax and business rates will only become apparent during the year. But again, that's, that's based on our best forecast at this moment. And again, I'll, I'll pause there and uh, invite questions if that's okay. 16 million, it's, it's certainly not as worrying as the 30 million. At least we know now where we stand with that. It's still a worrying figure for us as an authority. And hopefully it won't result in a, in a 114 notice being, being applied for. Um, however, I, I should imagine there's probably still some savings as well that we're making in areas because not all of our buildings are open. Um, you know, there's, there's things like our, our leisure centres are not open, some of our offices are not open, so we're making savings there. Um, transport, for instance, for, for children to schools, are we, is that, you know, are we making any savings there as well? So is this being looked at as well? Are we looking at areas where we're not spending as much as what we usually spend to see where that's coming in and can we offset that with what we're actually, you know, looking at we, that we need within that 16 million? On that particular point, yes, we are looking at the same time um, where we are making savings in, in terms of building relating costs. Yes, we take that into account, uh, but they're relatively small in relation to some mm. of the additional costs. Even some of the examples that you mentioned, such as um, sports, for example, whilst we might be making some savings in terms of the running costs of the buildings, we still employ the staff that actually work in those buildings but we're not actually generating the income to pay for those people. So um, it is an additional cost to the council in that respect. Mm. Okay. I think Councillor Dickinson, you want to come in with a question on that? No? No, no, no I don't actually. Um, I had a half a question for, for the previous item, but uh, this is actually covering it more adequately and uh, the questions have been answered. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay. Councillor Holden. Got a few questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the first one, I'm, I'm assuming that, like many organisations, we've gotten, we will have a number of staff who have been furloughed. Um, yeah. And would that include things like staff in, le in the leisure services, etc.? Um, have any savings been made from the changes to waste collection services? Um, I note this week that we've gone, uh, or, or last week, we've gone from uh, recycling collections from fortnightly, uh, sorry, from weekly down to fortnightly. Now, we outsource that service. So does that mean that as a council, we are making savings from that service not being provided? Um, with the refuse site, the um, recycling centres, not some of those not being open, do we get a rebate back from that? You know, there, there are a number of areas where, where I do have concerns. Um, it's great to see that that 30 million figure has, has dropped significantly. Um, but I'm assuming at some point we will, we will get more clarity on on the numbers that you're now talking about as far as breakdown with regards to what percentage of that is lost income from leisure services, from parking, et cetera. Um, so that, those, those were some of the key things. Um, one of which that did really stand out in the, um, in the report that was presented to cabinet was the figure of 600,000 pounds to uh, house 21 individuals, I think, so far. Um, it seemed an inordinate amount of money to me to house 21 people. Now, I've had someone come, because I've raised questions uh, earlier, um, and someone has come back and said, uh, well, some of that is because they've got 24-7 support. It still seems an awful lot of money. If they're providing group support to 21 people, uh, with regards to substance abuse, etc., it, it still sounds a lot of money to me. And 
you know what what checks and balances have we got on making sure that this that we're getting the best value for money i think that's about it for the time being thank you councillor holden would would you like me to try and respond to those points oh yeah please sorry nigel yeah if you if you could okay um in terms of the first point about furloughing I mean, that's something that um, has been perhaps a bit of a grey area as far as local authorities are concerned. Obviously, it applies and has applied to businesses, but it's something that we are um, genuinely looking at in terms of um, whether we can do that in terms of furloughing staff who are not employed at the moment. Um, in terms of the waste costs, um, I'd need to check that in terms of what the contractual position is with regard to our payment for services that are not being provided at the moment in terms of recycling centres. So that's one I'll, I'll definitely need to come back on. Um, in terms of breakdown of the, the various costs and loss of income, um, there's something that uh, I will be reporting to Cabinet in July is providing an update on both the current financial position, an update on the projections in terms of additional costs and loss of income, uh, which will then incorporate um, even more up-to-date figures. So that, that level of detail will be in the report that goes to Cabinet in July. And then the £600,000 that you refer to on homelessness, um, yes, uh, there is a, a, a detailed breakdown of where that figure has been arrived at and how that's actually being contractually committed to. Um, a number of options were explored in terms of trying to provide that facility for people who otherwise would not be able to maintain um, social distancing, et cetera, and not be in a safe environment. So a number of options were looked at at that, but again, it's um, uh, further information which can be made available to the scrutiny board if, if so wish. Yeah, I think... Sorry, Councillor Holden, I completely... I was just, just going to thank Nigel for his response, and, and if that information could be distributed mm. uh, to the panel, I'd, I'd personally appreciate it. Yeah, I, I'd like to see that information as well. I mean, it, it broken down, it's £1,190 per week per person. Is that over a, over a six-month period? And it's quite a worrying amount of money to be spent on, a, on an individual. Fair enough, we have a, a duty of care to the people in Calderdale, homeless or not. Uh, but I think when it comes to the procurement of, of various things for those people, I think we need to look closely at how we're spending it and, and where we're spending it. And I think there's probably a, a much cheaper option, I think really personally, than, than that option that we've gone for. It's a, it's a lot of money in a time like this where we need to ensure that we're equal amounts of money going to everybody within Calderdale that need it at a time like this. So I'd, I'd like to see that breakdown of the report. Um, Councillor Lynn. Thank you. Yes, I think my question is probably as much to perhaps to Councillor Scullion um, as to Nigel. Um, and it's really about the um, what the prospects might be that um, whether through the offices of the LGA or SIGOM or the Met authorities and others, we might actually succeed in getting some more money out of central government mm. because I can't be the only person who was really thrilled when, you know, at the beginning of this, this pandemic emergency, local authorities were told, you know, just do whatever it takes and, you know, we'll have a furlough scheme, albeit as my understanding was that the furlough scheme did not apply to public sector employees specifically. It was, it was a business only scheme, but it may have changed. And I'm sure that Nigel's investigating that. But I mean, I suppose I'm just kind of like worried about the fact that we've gone from a position where we were told to just get on with it. And I think everybody in, in Calderdale Council and their partners to be congratulated for the speed and the efficiency and the dynamism that they put into kind of responding really, really quickly um, on the basis that, that the costs that we were incurring would be recompensed. And so, uh, you know, I would really like some some sense of um, what the lie of the land is in terms of how central government is likely to respond to this. So I don't know, it might be something whether the leader or, or Councillor Scullion might be able to come back and respond on that really. Because I think as a scrutiny panel, we can do so much in terms of scrutinising what Calderdale Council can do. But mm -hmm. what we've been hit with is really financial circumstances that are way outside our control. 
Um, we're doing our damnedest to sort it out. We're also doing our damnedest to deliver the savings that we were already committed to as a result of all the years and years of austerity. So I'd just like to get a sense of what are the prospects of government actually making good on their promises that we would not be out of pocket as authorities. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, I'll have Councillor Swift or Scullion or whoever wants to come in on that one. Anyone want to reply to Councillor Lynn? I'll, I'll start and Jane might want to add, add some detail. Um, I mean, I think the short answer to what's the prospect is we don't know. Um, and that is that is very worrying. So um, an initial statement of, as you said, effectively spend what is needed and an implication that the government would pick up all the costs has shifted to one of, um, well, we might cover the costs, we will cover the costs associated with COVID, but not necessarily the losses. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a nonsensical position because even for ourselves, if we had to find that 16 million, the, the idea, if that's the current gap, the idea that you could save that without having to cut some of the some of the very social care services and other that are supporting um, people with COVID that are making it possible to keep people out of hospital, et cetera, is ridiculous. So you can't separate the two. Um, of course, there are challenges because different authorities are impacted very, very differently by the loss of income. And there are a few councils who have taken some quite exceptional decisions about commercial income who are very much outriders. But I think the fact there are some hard cases shouldn't prevent government from giving a broad commitment across local government as a whole to recognise the challenge, certainly for the period that the crisis is going on. Um, you know, at the same time, there's going to be long term issues. And I think this brings to a head the fact that the way local government is funded as a whole um, is broken, you know, and that the, the income base for local government bears no relationship with the main demands and cost pressures that we face in terms of social care. But that's a, that's a much wider issue. So right now, I think you could say that the LGA, SIGOMA is a specialist group for metropolitan authorities, individual leaders. We are all keeping the pressure up. We're making sure that ministers fully understand. We're making sure that, you know, Nigel and other finance officers are making sure that these figures are not something dreamed upon the back of the envelope, that they are carefully calculated and thought through to make the strongest and most defensible case possible. But if we if they want local communities to be in a position to respond and recover from this, they've got to make sure that councils don't end up uh, crippled in their response because of the loss of income resulting from COVID. Yeah, yeah, fully agree. Thank you, Councillor Swift. Um, Chair, may I come in? Of course you can, Councillor Scullion. Thank you. I think it's worth remembering that we're still in the middle of this. And as, as Nigel said at the beginning, uh, we are actually um, keeping things updated day by day. And the MHCLG, the government department, are now asking local authorities for regular returns in terms of what we're spending. And as the leader said, we started out with spend what you like and get, get to grips with this pandemic. We've got your backs mm -hmm. to, oh, no, 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 we didn't, we didn't mean that. Um, um, you know, we're not responsible for loss of income and the other, the other related costs. Um, I'm an optimist and I know that lots of councils, in fact, the majority of councils are affected in some way by this, some of them very badly. Mm. I'm an optimist that the government will see sense and begin to have a, a proper dialogue with us about this. That optimism is tempered, of course, by Mr. Broadbent as the Director of Finance, always saying, yes, we have to plan for the worst. We have to hope for the best, but we have to plan for the worst. And I suppose I put the scrutiny board and, and the members on notice that actually if help doesn't come from central government, then we will be having to have very serious conversations and meetings with all members and indeed temporary budget uh, decisions to be made that I think would be very unpalatable for all of us and, and for our residents if we're forced into that position. So I would urge all members really to lobby the government um, to have those conversations with local government and try and come to a settlement that actually means that 
we don't get to that situation, which would be relatively soon, really. We are watching the situation day by day by day, and we are, um, as I say, hoping for the best and hoping for government to, to see sense in mm -hmm. relation to local government's finances. But we are also planning planning for the possibilities. That's what Responsible Council does. But um, we'd really appreciate everybody's help in getting that message to central government. We do. Where are our MPs at the moment on this? Obviously, government have now sort of like gone back to, to work this week. Um, are they, I'm hoping, obviously, they will be fighting our corner down there for us. Is there anything from them? Are we hearing anything from them? I mean, we've certainly um, kept them kept them both briefed and copied in on what the position is. Um, and we do have, um, usually Chief Executive and myself has a, a conversation, um, was initially weekly, now every other week, with, with both of the MPs about it. Um, unfortunately, the last one got cancelled cancelled because of other other clashes but we have another conversation on friday so uh, we will we will push it push it again there okay councillor robinson you want to come in hi sure yes thank you very much and thank you to, to nigel and everyone else for for presenting the the report um, my question is mainly about uh, treasury management and inter authority lending um i've just been uh, had a really exciting day been looking at the uh, the quarter, quarterly borrowing and investment data uh, provided by the government i've been looking at the local authorities uh, investments quarter 3 uh, 19 to 20 and i've just established that colliday we have got some monies uh, and some capital invested uh, in in local authorities um, they are low amounts, but nonetheless, we do have some capital invested. Um, and I'm just wondering, really, uh, is this is this a growing trend? Um, and what's uh, what, what's our exposure to the risk, considering that local authorities are under substantial pressure? Thank you. Okay, Nigel. <laughs> um. Thanks for that question. Um, in terms of, I don't, I'm not sure it's a growing trend in terms of investing in other local authorities. We have a, a treasury management strategy and policy that's agreed each year by council and it allows us to invest um, in certain financial institutions, including local authorities, up to certain levels. So there are predefined levels of commitment that we can make in terms of our investment, depending upon the strengths of the financial institutions. Now, we do um, invest in other local authorities and similarly they with us. And it's um, actually quite a regular occurrence where uh, local authorities on a day-to-day -day basis will trade with each other depending upon their own cash flow positions. Um, they tend to be short-term investments um, and it usually is based upon, as I say, the particular cash flow position of any local authority at any one particular time. Um, so it is something that's quite regular. We will only invest up to certain levels to ensure that we um, can minimise that risk. And also, I suppose there's also the question there about um, our local authorities uh, more or less uh, of a risk than some of the financial institutions, banks and building societies that we invest in. So we bear all that in mind and, and try to minimise the risk, but clearly also try to balance that against getting a decent return on monies as well. Uh, but it's also tied in a policy, so individual officers within my service only work up to those levels and won't, will not exceed those levels unless it's been agreed by council or through some other uh, delegated authority. Right, there's no more questions coming in. Nigel, I don't know if you want to anything to say finally on this. Uh, no, I don't think there is anything else, Chair. Unless I uh, say, unless there are any further questions, the report will be updated um, okay. for July's cabinet, and will include also the information about um, 
the support that's been put through the council to businesses in terms of business support grants as well and uh, the council tax hardship fund so again that information will be updated in the july report okay do we know where we actually stand at the moment with regards to the uh, the business grants at what percentage have actually gone out so far um we've paid in total just over 4,900 grants uh, with a total of, I think it's about 55 million pounds now. That's, um, that's less than our allocation, uh, but I think I expected it to be less than our allocation or certainly I expect it now because there's a number of businesses that will not claim the grant um, because of state aid rules. Those are mainly national chains where they can only claim amounts up to a certain level nationally uh, so they will pick and choose where they claim business grants from which local authorities when they've got a shop in uh, most major towns um, so I wouldn't expect us to use the allocation in full um, but we're into beyond 90% paid now um, and it's uh, I think most businesses who are, um, have requested a grant um, have actually got them now Okay, so if we've actually been allocated 65 million for grants and, and so far 55 million has gone out, what about that 10 million? Is it, can that be used anywhere else? Is that something, we, is, you know, there's, uh, there's 10 million there that we really could do with right now. I what, happen, what, happens, what happens with that? <laughs> I, I, wish it, I wish it could be used. At the moment, that money would go back to, to government in that... Um, there's clear rule around the, the scheme that if a local authority has any spare funding at the end of the scheme, they give it back to government and equally, if they spend more than the allocation, then they can claim more. Um, the bit of leeway within there is that the uh, government announced a discretionary fund, um, which is 5% of the allocation. Um, so we are la launching a discretionary fund uh, which is around £3.2 million. So that will use part of, of that spare allocation at the moment. And whilst the scheme is still open, we will continue to make payments, grant payments to any eligible businesses that make an application. Right. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Councillor Holden, you want to come back in? You've got a quick question. Yeah, in fact, it was regarding the discretionary funding um, the discretionary grant funding um has that scheme now gone live and and what sort of take up are, are we looking at the um the scheme hasn't gone live in terms of it's been publicized in terms of the criteria and the amounts of grants and the businesses that will be eligible in the first instance so we uh, there was a requirement to publicize uh the criteria in the first instance so that's happened um, and then the, uh, the actual applications will be invited from later on this week. Um, and then uh, for a three week period and um, the maximum grant that, that we're making available is 10,000 uh, pounds. But I said, we can only award grants up to 3.2 million pounds. Otherwise there would be at the expense of the local authority rather than using the government funding. Um, but clearly, uh, we expect uh, the demand for grants for the discretionary fund to, uh, to quite possibly exceed the amount that's available um, and we'll uh, clearly continue to, to lobby to see if we can use any more of that, uh, that available funding um, on a discretionary basis. Mm. Thanks, Nigel. Okay. Uh, there's no more questions coming through. Um, I really appreciate the hard work that everybody is doing. You know me, when it comes to times like this, uh, how passionate I am about being a councillor for Colley and for this authority. You know, I take my hat off to every officer, every council member, every member of staff that we have, and what they've done during these unprecedented times. Um, this, makes, this is one of the proudest moments for me to say I'm a part of this authority during these times. Um, it is hard. We have tenacity. That's one of the things we have as an authority in Calderdale. Uh, we have vision. We know what we want and what we want to achieve as an authority. And I think we have the strength that gets us through issues like this, through times like this. And it is hard. 
And, and like I say, and a lot of us are probably having sleepless nights. Nigel, I've said before to you, I, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Um, Ian, as well, at this moment in time, all of you, basically. But we will get there. We will get through this. There is a light at the end of this tunnel, and we can see it. So thank you to, to everybody for everything that you're doing. Keep strong, keep going, and we will get there. Not long, hopefully, and hopefully we won't have a second wave, fingers crossed. We're going to move on now to um, item seven, which is the work plan. Uh, so Nigel, Ian, uh, Councillor Scully and Councillor Swift, you, you, you're more than welcome to leave at this point because we're only going to discuss now moving thank forward with our thank work you, plan. Chair. So thank you very much for, for being a part of tonight's meeting. So thank you and stay safe. Okay, now then. Uh, Mike, <laughs> Mike or Lauren? Yeah, do you want me to start and then I'll bring Mike in? You can do one, um, yeah. I think we'll, uh, yeah, I'll let you start on this then. All right. Um, so, so usually around this time of year, we, we meet with direct directorate management teams and look at the service priorities for the year. Obviously, s and is a little bit different because of where it sits and the remit that it has. Um, I know that as outlined in the annual report, there's a few items to come back from last year. Um, and then obviously Councillor Lynn mentioned the um, diversity review to bring forward too. So I think on that theme, there's also the legal services HR recruitment items. Um, as a board, we also discuss the corporate performance. And um, myself and Mike actually had a meeting, an initial meet with um, Jez lead for that on Friday, just to discuss those areas. Right. And perhaps for SP, just being able to drill some of those areas down and invite service services along to talk to some of that. So we'll put something together and share that with the board um, and see if there's an appetite for that. Okay. And um, also, I think yourself, Councillor Bellinger, had mentioned previously around communications and PR in line with scrutiny in the council. Mm. Um, so those are areas we need to consider and build in if members are agreeable. Um, and obviously, as well as the mid to longer term items, there's probably going to be the short to mid term around COVID um, and anything under our remit that you might wish to look at, sort of thinking around the HR um, staffing, if there's anything around IT infrastructure um, yeah. and any suggestions from members, of course, always welcome. It's your work programme. So. Yeah. Well, I was hoping that, that Jackie was going to join us this evening. She usually does. On, on yeah, she her, sent her apologies. Oh, she sent her, her apologies. It'd be interesting to know, I suppose, really, as a, as a point of view, where we stand currently with our staffing levels, you know, how many people are actually still off, how many people have come back to work, how many people have been tested, you know, how many people are in, in, in isolation still get, getting those figures. It would have been good for this evening. Um, and I think really by the time we get round to that, which will be July time, it's probably information that's too late then, I think, to be honest. Um, going back with regards, um, Jess coming in on our, um, what was it again? Uh, on the corporate performance. On the corporate performance, yeah, sorry, senior moment. On the corporate performance, I think it's good that we can actually get the officers to come in on, onto that as well, because at least we can get their side of things, why things are not improving, and if there's anything we can do to assist them. Uh, so basically, we get it from the, the horse's mouth. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, does anybody have any suggestions that they want to put on that work? I think we've got yeah. Councillor Lynn and Councillor Robinson and Councillor Porritt. <laughs> right, OK. I've got... Yeah, council in your your first, if you want to come in. Right. Um, yes, I, I guess one of the things that I think is quite important in view of the discussions that we've just had about finance are that we don't overload our um, program around about the August, September, October time. Yeah. Because if things don't work out as we hope and we don't get any relief um, from the financial hall that we're we're in at the moment, um, then we're going to be faced with the councils and, and full council's going to be faced almost certainly with an emergency budget mm. in September or October. Um, and so all I'm saying is that I think we, although we should be ambitious about, you know, thinking about things we want to talk about, for me, that we are the, um, you know, we are, the, it, it, it's us as a scrutiny board that 
have really got the primary responsibility to be looking at budget issues. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're going to be faced with making significant um, cuts and economies and everything, because um, because you know, otherwise we're at risk of having a, a section 114 notice, then uh, then I really think we've got to keep some capacity for that. That was all I wanted to say. Thanks. No, I, I agree fully, Councillor. To be honest, I've had sleepless nights. It is worrying times. It really, really is. And I, I dread to think what situation we're going to be in if we have a second wave. I really, I really don't want to think about it. But unfortunately, we have to, just in case. We have to be prepared. We never saw this coming. Um, and, and look how hard it's been. So at least now we're in that situation where we potentially know that there could actually be a second wave. And if there is, we need to be prepared for that financially. So hopefully not, but uh, we need to be. Um, Councillor Robinson. Hello, Chair. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, anyone who's um, been aware of Coldwell politics recently will be very, very aware that I'm, I'm interested in the, all of the change that is occurring at the moment, especially like, for example, the internal change with how, how our staff are operating, um, the way our services are run. I think it's incredibly interesting at the moment. And, you know, some of the change probably isn't good in terms that, for example, we've got 100% of meetings online. In the future, are we going to have 100% of meetings online? Probably not. Um, but some of the change is good as well. So I think it would be good to incorporate uh, into our work programme um, some change items, some items that are basically looking at what's happened during COVID and say, hey, actually, is this good? Is it bad? Should we continue doing it? How has it impacted us? I think it's a really interesting time. Uh, specific subjects, which I think are interesting. Working practices. So council staff, um, you know, should it be mandatory that they have one day a week working from home? Would that reduce congestion on our roads? Would it improve air quality? Uh, would it improve their, their working the, the way they feel about work as well. Um, online scrutiny meetings, I think that's another another interesting discussion that we at Strategy do need to have. Um, should, moving forward, uh, should a lot of our council meetings be online? Should they be face-to-face? -face, or is there a bit of a compromise? Uh, I think that's an incredibly interesting point because we all work. We've, we've all got families. Um, actually, working having meetings on Zoom, for me, it's been quite beneficial. Uh, so I think that's another thing that needs looking at. Final thing is services. Uh, the contact centres be moved fully online. I think that's quite interesting. Uh, could that have cost savings for the council in the future? Um, how does that affect our elderly? Because a lot of them don't use technology. Have they been able to get in touch with the council? Uh, registrars, they've moved online. I don't know if anyone's ever been to a registrar office to register a death. I certainly have, and it's not a nice experience at all. So I think there's a lot of positives. COVID-19, it's inherently negative, but there's also a lot of positives that we've, uh, we've implemented. So I would like to incorporate these, these uh, subjects into our work plan, if anyone else agrees. I, yeah, I think there's a lot there actually to cover. And I think, like anything else, like after the flooding, we always had a, a look at what were what went well and what didn't go well and what we can improve on. And it'll be the same with, with this. This is new to us. So there'll be times where we'll have to sit down. Our officers will be doing it as well, what worked and what and what didn't work. And I think that's good that you know that something like this can actually come to the scrutiny board as well, definitely. I'm open, you know, I'd like to get other members' thoughts on this, to be quite honest, because it's quite a big, big area, really, to, to look at, George. So what are members' thoughts on this? Anybody? Uh, can I just come in there? Um, George, come. Yeah. 
because my, my question actually is uh, alarmingly almost exactly the same as George's, uh, <laughs> singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, but yeah, actually looking at this as well in terms of what went right and what went wrong, um, in terms of accessibility as well, because I think these meetings are now significantly more accessible to members of the public and mm. potentially the, the town hall physically isn't a particularly accessible building, but there is the potential for something moved moved online is does it make it more accessible obviously it makes it less accessible to some people it makes it more accessible to others um there's cost implications i'm um, going back to what council Lynn was saying about you know what, what's needing to, to save money is there the potential with moving virtually for some working practices and going back again to what council robinson was saying about um working from home part of the time does that mean there's the potential to save in terms of building costs, um, you know, office space. There's so, this opens up so much in terms of working practices. It's a huge piece of work. Obviously, it's not just for us to do. And I don't think it's for us to do yet either. Mm -hmm. I think we are still, as has been said already in this meeting, we are still in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. And I think the time for um, looking at, the time for scrutinising the response and the time for looking at how we work going forwards um isn't yet um but when that time comes i think if, if we've started to accumulate some questions some ideas um i think there's like like council robinson was saying there's a potential for this actually be an opportunity and a really exciting time um to work in new ways mm. i agree i mean i still like to see meetings take place in the town hall but with the technology that we have there's nothing stopping certain members if they can't actually make it to the town hall for meetings that they can you know have a live link with a screen within the meeting room so at least they can still be present at that meeting but not actually there in in, in person so and i think that will you know one of the things that we can actually look at i think it's a long-term thing is this it's not something that's going to happen overnight um but i certainly see a future there with it because we've got the technology you know let's harness that and, and 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 use it to the best of its abilities and make things easier for us and our staff and our officers at the end of the day um i think putting something like this it would probably need a bit of a scrutiny in a, in a day sort of thing mike i'm, I'm going to look at you on this what are your thoughts a bit of a scrutiny review group i think maybe you're on mute mike Mike, still on mute. Yeah, well, you're there. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, as, as, as you were talking, Chair, I was just writing down scrutiny in a day. Um, and I think I think that um, what I was going to say more generally about your work programme is um, I, I think I think scrutiny in a day or you know, a, a, a three or four hour session that some of you were involved, I believe, in the West Yorkshire Combined Authority Review. Um, and more recently in another scrutiny board, the Youth Service Review that was done by CYP. Yeah. Um, more or less was scrutiny it was scrutiny a day plus a bit yeah. Uh, yeah. had a fairly short punchy report and which has gone down very well and i think um if you you know if in, in your work program i think there will be opportunities to do that sort of work uh, over the year and i think you should should take advantage of that um mm -hmm. so so i noticed in the chat that a couple of councillors had said good idea i think that was in response to councillor robinson's um suggestion mm -hmm. so i think i think there seems to be some uh some willingness to pick up on that councillor robinson and and i um met as in councillor robinson's role as chair of place board with um zora zancudi and mark coles and and mark coles and zora had a a view that um and this is on councillor porritt's point i think about timing <clears throat> is that there's a risk if we wait too long for, to do this stuff that we we just go back to the old ways of doing things and the opportunities of looking at, you know, how we do things differently, perhaps are, um, you know, are in the autumn rather than 2021, if you see what I mean. That's the, yeah, yeah. That would be the sort of time frame. Um, and bearing in mind, we will still be in the midst of this in the autumn and probably in many, in many respects through, through, um, uh, through the winter. So I think, I think that that's really a technique that's worth thinking about. And the other comment I'd like to make is, uh, is, what people, is about what people have said about accessibility. So 
when we when we when we got the contract for um uh for what do we call it when we, for 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 streaming uh the council meetings what's what oh, I'm, yeah. i've lost the word we've got a contract with public eye for yeah, yeah. Uh, council meetings cabinet meeting and cabinet meetings and planning meetings but not for scrutiny so the this process has immediately made scrutiny more accessible to the you know because it has to the public and certainly i'll be going back saying i think that's a real benefit and a real benefit of change and how can we how can we use the uh, webcasting sorry that's the word i was really struggling for how can mm -hmm. we use the webcasting when we go back to meeting in committee room b to make these meetings more accessible um so i think that's all i was going to say and you know at, at this point no that's fine i think we've got time to do a bit of scoping basically on on this um and like I say, depending on how things pan out over the next few months, is is between now and, and, and autumn time, is get our facts and figures together of what we can and, and can't do, and then have that scrutiny review uh, within a day. George, how do you feel about that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think it's a really good good suggestion. Um, obviously, um, Mike's point is, is correct when he says we, we can't we can't do it right now because offices are at capacity. However, we can't wait too long because otherwise we'll forget everything and everything we'll, we'll get back into habits. Habits take seven yeah. years to change, and and if you think how many habits have we changed in three months of lockdown? Um, so yeah, we need to pick an ideal time. Uh, one thing that possibly might be a good idea if we get together as a group of councillors. Um, in an informal environment over Zoom, uh, just to brainstorm ideas to get everything together, and then somehow we need to say to officers, you know, is there anything that you recommend? Are there any change items that you you have in have you've implemented and you think's worked? And then from there we pick it up, and then we we ask for some formal reports. That's if we're integrating it within the work plan. If we're doing it as part of a, a review then it would become very much a, a review piece of work. Um, but I, I, I think it's a great opportunity. And it's something that we as members, we can all work on it and we can all, yeah, just, just uh, enjoy it. I think it's a good opportunity. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I agree. Uh, Councillor Alden, you want to come in as well? Yeah, uh, just to say I agree with uh, previous two councillors' comments regarding and regarding technology. I, I think we're probably all becoming a lot more efficient. Mm. Um, it would be good to actually see this permeating throughout the council. So often I've gone into council buildings and seen meetings and more meetings and meetings for meetings' sake. Um, when actually I think. I think we should be leading by example. Now, the only problem I foresee possibly is I know uh, the ability to have meetings was rushed through as an emergency piece of legislation. It's just whether the government decide to turn that around further down, yeah. further down the line. And that would, that would be one of my concerns, which is why I think we're, we're better off doing this piece of work sooner rather than later. And, and then, if needs be, we can actually make representations based on that on that scrutiny work, and and sent and get that sent to Whitehall, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 let's let's make our feelings known on this. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing that uh, I got is regarding the the work plan, and you touched on the I, I think there's the peace hall listed for the 14th of October. Um, I know the invite has been turned down in in the past uh, from the from the Peace Hall Trust. However, we have two elected members on the board of trustees at the Peace Hall. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's those two elected members or one of the two elected members that that should be really attending our meeting. If we've if we've got questions to ask of the trust. Those are our representatives on that on that board of trustees, and those are the people we should be directing our questions to. Um, so that's 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 my my view on it anyway. Mm -hmm. I think there, there were a couple of things really with regards to the peace hall um, item. 
and that was one of the things were around communication. I think George, did you have some input on this as well? Um, we wanted to ensure really that we were working from the same hymn sheet basically with, with the Peace Hall Trust and that the communication was there between them and, and us as an authority to ensure that we were doing what we can to, to assist them the best we can, but that we also knew what issues they were facing as well. Now, fair enough, I, I, I see your point there that we have two uh, members actually on that trust and you know those two members really should be the people that come back with them forwards from us to Peace Hall Trust itself. But it's also good to hear it. I mean, we did, like I say, we extended that invite to to Nikki Chance Thompson to, to come along, basically to have a chat to us, so we could get her thoughts really as to how the piece all was running, how she saw it to be running in the next sort of like twelve months, two years, and just so we could keep an eye on our finances as well and our lending to that piece all, and that our investment, you know, we can see that our investment's going to come back from that. But I do see your point. Because uh, it's Councillor Swift and Councillor Baines who are actually on that trust, and I think hopefully then at that meeting, all being well, um, that they attend that that meeting, so we can ask these questions, and, and hopefully Nicky Chance Thompson, you know, will, will come along as well to sit in on that meeting, so we can ask her questions if if needs be. Shouldn't have to be there, but it'd be nice, be nice to see her there. Um, Lauren, you wanted to come in at this point as well. Yeah, just to say really quickly, an invite did go out to Nikki and um, she was due to take that to a board meeting and it right. was just at the time that we actually went into lockdown. Um, right. So I'll follow that up, but I just wonder if they maybe haven't met or if they might have met since, but virtually. So I'll pick up on that and just see where we're at with it. But yeah, the invite definitely went and it's not been turned down. So yeah. I just think wanted to feed is, that back. The thing is, things are sort of like still a little bit up in the air at the moment as well with regards to meetings. Aren't we? we just don't know what's going to happen in a few months' time. So it, I suppose the work plan really, it, it, it's difficult for us to, to plan ahead in a way. Um, I don't know. I, I'm finding it a little bit difficult to put things on that work plan because we don't know where we're going to be from one week to the next. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Member thoughts. Member thoughts can come back to us after this meeting anyway. If anybody's got any ideas of what they'd like to see on there, we can, we can add them and send it out via email to everybody and say, well, this is an idea that's come up from, you know, council in, for instance, this is what we want to, to add to that. Because it does look a bit, it does look quite light, <laughs> I must admit. So, did did councillor want to come in, councillor manager? Sorry, councillor Lynn. Lynn. Yeah, councillor Lynn, you want to come yes, in? Yes, I just want, yes, it's just, just wanted to quickly remind ourselves, as far as the Peace Hall is concerned, that um, I think it was last... October, November time, um, a report went to Cabinet um, uh, allowing for a £375,000 annual revenue grant to be, to, to be given to the PSOL over the next four years. And a condition which many of us were very keen to see put onto that was that it wasn't an automatic extension um, and that at the end of the first, you know, partway through the first year of it happening, um, and it was suggested it would probably be around about October time, mm. the Peace Hall would be expected to come back in front of us um, to actually talk about how things have gone. Now, obviously, the poor old Peace Hall has been affected by COVID-19, the same as everybody else has. Exactly. But it was, it was just that um, the, the circumstances in which the council was asked to make this special, really large amount of money available at a time when we hadn't even... We didn't even know what savings in other items uh, we were going to be expected to make in the February budget. But we were we had to do this in order that the Peace Hall, um, you know, could, could finish its 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 uh, could 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 continue to, to be going forward in a, in a positive way. And we were all very happy to do it because we're all very proud of the Peace Hall. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we did say that, yes, but it's conditional upon you being prepared to come back during 20, 2021 and talk to us about how you have restructured you know how you are restructuring in order mm. to mm. cut your coat to suit your cloth really so i don't think it's i don't think it's optional for for, um, for somebody from for, for nikki chance thompson or anybody else to come back to us i think they are i think it's a condition if you go back and look Let's at the in, report that right. authorized that grant i think you'll find it was a condition of it right i think and one of the other th the other things as well is, is nigel mentioned this before that because they wanted to draw down the other two hundred and fifty thousand pound as well um, on a regular basis, that 
he would also have some input and meet with them every six months, I think he said he was going to do, just to keep an eye on things financially and see how we're actually coping as well. So I should imagine we'll actually have that as well at some point to come back from Nigel to see how, you know, what uh, how the meetings have gone, if, if they've happened, I suppose. Uh, I don't think there's anybody wanting else wanting to come in. Um, I can't really think of anything else that we need to add at this moment in time. Has anybody got anything else they'd like to add? If not, I'm happy to move forward and uh, end the meeting. Sir Lauren, I can do a bit of this on those comments. Yep. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Right. I think then, everybody, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think it's been gone relatively well this evening. Uh, certainly interesting. And our first time live as well. I won't be watching it back. Uh, Angie, remind me not to take you to an auction. <laughs> um <laughs> So no, thank you everybody. There's some good stuff there. Uh, George has certainly that certainly legs as that that your proposal. Uh, we've certainly got some things to look at. And like I say, with regards to the work plan, anybody's got any ideas, send them forward. Let's have a look at them, throw it out to everybody, and then we'll stick it on the work plan for the next time or the next few months, which is going to be, I think, July. We've probably got quite a bit of space there. And we've nothing in for August or September. So it's quite light. But then again, we didn't know that we're all going to be here, did we, as well? So there we go. I'm glad you're all still with us for another year. Right. OK. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Mike, Lauren, do you want to stay on for a minute or two? I'll just catch up with you and, and Naeem, even. No, I'm all right. I'm going to go. I'm going to get take my med medicine. Right. Okay, dokie. Okay. Okay. No Councillor Bellinger? Oh, yes, sorry. Councillor Bellinger, yes. I'm going to stop the live streaming now if the meeting is closed. That's fine. Thank you, Kirsty. Thanks, Chair.